So in the GEC, this is what we have in the basic GEC reactor. Um, it's built differently. It's a backfill unit such the hearth is, is very highly insulated. Um, but the um, actual uh, you know, money zones here are all the same. You have a hearth here in the middle. You're bringing in air to run combustion in this combustion cup area here, then we're running reduction down the end, supported by a grate, and then the gases are going out. Now, in our case here, um, you know, the, we, as you know, on the, the GEC, one of the main things we were doing on the GEC was to try to um, start to, to recapture all of this waste heat that's in the outgoing gas um, and take it back to process a point, appropriate points in the reactor. So one of the first things that was added in earlier was a, in the earliest stage was a very extensive um, air preheating system. Okay, so the gas as it come out here starts to pass over coils with air coming in in the opposite direction, such that by the time the air gets to the combustion area, it's at six or seven hundred C. Instead of it coming in an atmospheric and the combustion actually having to heat it locally before you get your reactions, you do all that work um, beforehand such that you can ultimately get higher combustion temperatures, better deal with your, your, your tar cracking, um, and be able to handle higher, higher um, uh, water loads. Okay? So it's virtuous circles that start to happen when you start mining these wastes and returning them to useful flows in the reactor. So the basic GEC downdraft reactor added this very, or, you know, very extensive air preheating system. Unfortunately, the, the amount of air coming in is, is not enough to take up all of the heat of the outgoing gas. The outgoing gas has over twice the amount of available heat that the incoming air can intake. So you can only pull the temperature down about halfway from the end of reduction um, to what would be atmospheric. Okay? So you can only return about half of, the, half of the energy back in through the air. But that's fine, because there's other, there's other feedstocks coming in that are equally, if not more important, um, which is the biomass. So the next stage of the, the, the GEC, when we went to the, the TOTI system, is going to a system that's preheating both the air and the biomass. You're preheating the incoming fuel as well as the, the um, incoming air, and using those, both of those flows, to cool the outgoing gas. Okay? While in principle having hot outgoing gas isn't an issue, in practice, as soon as you're trying to make any device, you now have to get that gas cool to a temperature that you can put it into an engine or do something with it. So um, to the degree to which we can make a big um, multi-stage uh, counterflow heat exchanger, we don't have to make another radiator cooler to dump this stuff downstream. So we have less components, less complexity, um, and um, an ultimately smaller thing. So, this heat exchange scenario architecture that we came up with is, is a core part of why we can build these in this compact form factor and not have all of these stages that you have a dedicated piece of equipment that does each, each se section. Okay, so back to the, what happened. So here is the, the hearth area. This is a, a, a hearth type that's it's called a in Swedish inverted V hearth that you don't actually make the bell up here because that forms passively in the ash. But you can imagine that that is a hearth. Air is coming in. We have combustion here. Reduction down through the reduction bell. Passes over the incoming air. Gets um, the gas down to the, somewhere between um, 250 and 400 C. Then goes out the cyclone. Drops the particulates out. And then we take it into a drying stage. Okay. Um, the drying stage is it's called the drying bucket. It's now a different shape on here. It's trapezoidal. This is, a much, this is the early kind of concept model. But after we've done the work of preheating the air, we now take it into preheating or drying the fuel. The gas after it comes out of here is about, is about um, 200 C, which is once it's going through this double jacketed feed auger here, is cool enough that you're going to basically reasonably stay out of pyrolysis in your drying zone. Okay? We're trying to also in this prevent these zones mixing such that the mess can be contained. So your, your heating flow that you want to use in the drying stage, you want it to be cool enough that you're not starting pyrolysis in your drying stage. So that's why we, one, take it through the, the cyclone, um, and two, we take it through there so we don't have schmutz in it or less schmutz 
such that you don't get you don't get soot in the in your double jacket here. Okay, so. The heat that was in the outgoing gas here has now done two important pieces of work for you. It has preheated your air up to combustion temperatures, reacts immediately when it comes in, doesn't need any heating, and you've also um, uh, put enough heat in here that you've vaporized all of your, your water out of the fuel, relieving the main drag there, which is the, the, um, the vaporization um, energy. Um, and got it up to 150 C or so, such that the things down here have to, have to do less work. Okay? The result on the gas side coming out is you now have your gas coming out of here. It used to go up, but this is coming out of here at 100, 100 C or so. So you've got your gas cool by using your fuel and your air as a radiator. Okay? And that's how these units get by with not having a radiator, which a radiator is standard in most gas fire architectures. What? What's a workable moisture level for your feedstock? Uh, we can do up to about 30% um, regularly. You can run it higher at times. It also it depends what flow rate you're doing. So as the flow rates and power mounts go higher, you can go higher. But we are still limited to that any fuel or water vapor that water that's vaporized in the hopper, it doesn't go out. It goes down through the system. Okay, so there is a limit. You get too much and you start to snuff, snuff all this. This toddy design, this is the, the fuel flow. It's going through this L leg. So gaseous, the hot. Yeah, so the gas is first passing through an annular space here. And then in this, it's passing it through an annular space around this, the fuel pathway. So they're double jackets. They're two walled vessels. The fuel's in the middle, and the gases are going back and forth around that in a jacket. So I was wondering how you prevent the suction from the tire gases to go up and join the. the yeah, gas. so this. So the, this flow isn't going back into the bed. Okay. Okay. It is a ja it's a jacket that's not, that's not contiguous with the internal vessel. Simply heating up the inner jacket to help Correct. the process. Correct. Correct. And there's baffles in there such that things go back and forth and try to maximize the amount of heat transfer we can get. Okay. So most all of this is built as, as um, tubes within tubes. Um, Vessels, jackets, flows, whatnot. Um, sorry. Is Nick not here? I had to for Nick. Okay. So the moisture you're drying out of the fuel ends up going down into the It goes down into here, but you put a bunch of energy into it, so its impact is, is much greater. Okay? Um, and to the degree to which you can support uh, water loads in here, you get an improved gas coming out. Because remember, one of our main pathways of making the gas is uh, water vapor reducing over, over um, uh, charcoal. Now, usually we're getting that water vapor from combustion. But to the degree to which we do any combustion inside the gasifier, we're doing that with air that we've brought in, and air is 80% nitrogen. So the more combustion you do internally, the more you dilute your outgoing fuel gas with nitrogen and reduce the energy density. So, to the degree to which you can increase the amount of available heat in here, you can increase the amount of water, um, which gives you the feedstock for reduction without giving you nitrogen. So your energy density goes way up, okay? So, that's also part of the densification of this system, is getting the power density high by having a high energy density fuel. So our, in, our, our fuel energy density on this is, is above which, uh, well above what you see in, in standard non Regen uh, heat regenerative gasifiers. Jim, so what, what would be the minimum required uh, moisture content or would be the most ideal? Well, the problem is it moves around depending on how hard you're pulling it, um, the, the composition of the fuel. So the, um, I, the, the, best, the best average is about 20%, we find. Okay. Okay. Here's a uh, another rendering of the flows here. That's set out trying to show the fuel in color going from from uh, green stuff as it comes down through the drying bucket. It dries dry fuel, comes into the pyrocoil here, um, which I haven't talked about yet, and then falls down into the bell here. Um, runs the combustion combustion reduction steps. Gas comes out. 
passes by the air preheating heat exchanger, goes through the cyclone, comes up, passes through the drying heat exchanger, and then out into the filter. Okay? So, um, in a gas fire engine system, you have one, so you see here, we, we've, we've preheated the air, we've dealt with the drying stage, but this outgoing gas hasn't done anything with the pyrolysis stage, okay? The pyrolysis stage, um, ideally you want to be dealing with um, under 600 C, and it's, it's, um, it is, after you've done, done the air preheating here, the gas is too cool to do much meaningfully, meaningfully with pyrolysis, but it's nicely lined up temp-wise for, for drying. So we decided to use the exhaust gas out of the engine to do the pyrolysis stage. Okay? The challenge here is you have a bunch of waste heats coming from both the gasifier and the engine, and the, the, the thermal puzzle is how do you capture those and then re in, uh, reintroduce them at process appropriate points. This isn't a big pool of waste heat that you put into a big pool of, of good feed heat. You have to keep them segmented temperature-wise. So you're lining up um, particular heat amounts and at particular temperatures with appropriate needs in the system. And then trying to do that is something that's not a big sprawling collection of vessels that um, you, know, you don't want to make or use. So the big win in this was figuring out you know, which things mechanically, logic, uh, both thermally and mechanically made sense to put together, okay? So we came out with these relationships again of, of the, the outgoing gas first does the air because the air is always going in the opposite direction. It's right there where the gas is going in. You want that to be the hottest thing in this whole system, so we use the hottest source, which is that. Um, and after you've done that fully, you're left with this temperature that's quite reasonable for this. Um, Pyrolysis, there's nothing left after that deal with pyrolysis, um, and so we're using engine exhaust, which comes out um, between 500 and 700 C. It's usually right around 600, 650. Um, and so in all these units, you'll see one of the main features is exhaust goes back through a double jacketed heat exchanger that is the pyrocoil and drives all of your pyrolysis loads in the system um, such that it's not having a parasitic load on the combustion down here. Remember, back in the, the um, standard downdraft gasifier, all of these pyrolysis loads in drying are parasitic loads on the combustion. So to the degree to which you need temperature here to crack your tars, which you do, you need huge temperature, um, and you don't want to go to extremes to get to ri ridiculously dry fuel, these, these zones here are fighting you. There are a parasitic load on all this stuff here. Okay, so by adding this heat exchange system, we've, we use the engine heat to carry all of the, the, the pyrolysis loads and get the feedstocks up to about five or 600 C before they drop into the hearth. We use the outgoing gas to eliminate the, the drag of, the, the, of the, the air. It's not, you usually think air is a drag, but when you're going to combustion environment, all the reactants have to get up to reacting temperature. And that's happening through heat exchange microly in the local environment, okay? So we, we eliminate the air load and we eliminate the water load um, with using the remaining heat in the gas to, to dry the fuel here. So what you get out of this, this regenerative architecture here is something that approximates the um, heat relationships of the updraft gasifier where is everything that you put in as heat, you mine back, uh, you return to the system, but you do it without the gas coming, uh, going through those zones and getting nas nasty gas in um, your outgoing product. Okay? Um, this, the GEC toddy doesn't work until the engine's going, which this is a huge problem with people out in the field is they just like to run it with the flare. And the whole, this whole pyrolysis section isn't working correctly until the engine's operating, okay? So um, once you've run it, I mean, whenever you start a gasifier, because you want to be reducing from the beginning, you pre-fill the bottom here with char. If you just put wood down in there, you'd be getting pyrolysis in the base here so that your first gas coming out is is nasty tar gas. So you always pre-fill the reactor 
with charcoal, but then once it's running, it's, it's um, creating its own, own charcoal and, and refilling itself, okay? With this setup, it's even further that once you've run it, the, you know, the pyrocoil is creating char all the way up to the top here. It's not just happening down in here. So on your second start, it'll be very clean because you're starting into charcoal and not immediately having a pyrolysis um, process going on, creating tar gas that you're trying to convert down here before things are hot enough. Okay, does that make sense? The cleanest and most easiest to use gasifier is, is a charcoal gasifier. It's easy to use because you've already gotten all of the volatiles out of the fuel. Okay? If you've pre-pyrolysized -pyro the, the biomass, all you have is the, is the carbon. You don't have all the volatiles that are creating the tar gas. So you now have that thing like that updraft um, charcoal gas fire we showed before that you just burn and reduce. You get your outgoing gas and you're not having to fight any of the any of the tar gases, okay? So similarly, to have very clean startups on a gas fire, the more charcoal you have in here, the cleaner startup you'll get. The more biomass you have up in the top here, as it's getting up to temperature, that biomass starts to pyrolysize and creating tar, and you might not yet have the conditions down here to convert it, okay? So one nice thing we, we get with, with this system is after you run it once, you have this huge stack of charcoal here, so you're starting it essentially as a charcoal gasifier. So you get very clean starts. But not on the first one, because you're dependent on how clean that charcoal was that you put in there, or if the user even remembered to put charcoal in it, which um, they often don't, and so then you have a huge disaster mess through here. Okay? So that is the main, um, the, the main thermal win of the, the Gectati architecture, is it's, it's capturing all of the waste heats and returning them to do useful work in the reactor. That's giving you this uh, large thermal um, overhead um, that allows you to either run wetter fuels or better convert your tars. Um, it allows you to maintain higher temperatures in here, which is the, the critical variable to be able to, to um, crack the tars. But we also get another interesting thing here that's, that isn't typically noticed um, in that by externally driving the pyrolysis zone, uh, we can control the pyrolysis conditions in the reactor, okay? I said when we were going through pyrolysis that pyrolysis is this huge cocktail. Um, it starts with things that are fragments that comes off the biomass, but as temperatures go up, you get all sorts of recombination and evolution of the tars into um, more tightly bonded forms, okay? Basically, as the temperatures goes up, you keep getting progressively more double carbon bonds um, in the tars. And those are very high energy bonds, they're very difficult to pull them back apart, okay? So the problem in cracking tars down inside the system, if you've got to these more refractory tars, it's very difficult to get them to pull back apart, okay? Now in a standard downdraft gasifier, the pyrolysis ends up happening in this very narrow zone here right on top of combustion. Um, this is usually flowing fast enough that it doesn't really finish up in here. It finishes right on the top of combustion where, you know, it can be 1,200 degrees C there. So you end up running pyrolysis at very high temperatures, and you, and, and which results in nearly all of your tars evolving to these most difficult to deal with forms, which are called tertiary or, or, or um, um, uh, refractory tars. So one thing we get here by not relying on the high temp area down here to um, run pyrolysis, we run this whole pyrolysis um, column here in the five to 600 C range, um, which keeps it below the temperatures where you start to get the evolution up into the more difficult uh, tar types to crack later. Um, and what that gives you is more flexibility down here in the hearth to have less good combustion and cracking situations um, and still get good tar conversion. So instead of needing the perfect historic fuel, which were these big chunks of, you know, blocks of fuel, that had a lot of void space and exact right moisture content and species, you know, we can run um, more odd things. Um, we can run wood chips, which wasn't possible historically. Uh, we certainly have, still have limitations on, on size and void space, but because the tars are easier to crack, we can have less good conditions down here and still get reasonable tar conversion. So one of the main reasons why we, we don't have, um, um, or we've made so much progress on the, the tar conversion in this, is not 
just that we put a bunch of heat in it. It's that we also um, took control of pyrolysis. That's the part that's usually not realized. And while I can't quantify it, um, this, this is what I th I think one of the major drivers of why, why we get such good conversion out of the total system. Now, we're, so we're essentially keeping pyrolysis cool. Instead of it getting too hot and all the gas as it comes off involving these other things, we're keeping it cool, cooler, meaning um, 600 C and below, such that the gas doesn't evolve into these complicated forms. So then it migrates down here and it's immediately combusted. It doesn't hang around and have, have the, um, these evolutionary um, uh, journeys that then create more problems for us once we're trying to deal with it down here. So for, if, if you play around with like a biochar kill, they often will use the gases from the pyrolysis back in to kind of keep the flame going. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you could do or is there something wrong with doing that? Because they talked about that, cleaning the gases, and so then it's a very clean burn, supposedly, once pyrolysis gets going. Well, those are usually two stages. So there's a pyrolysis in the base that you'd have some amount of air coming in. Uh, pyrolysis can also, it has to be driven by heat, so you can have a partial combustion, but not enough that you get some pyrolysis, some combustion, but you have gases coming off, and then you have a secondary air coming in that's burning those gases up above. Okay, so and then taking those to full combustion. So that's a two-stage combustor that's going on there. And any like boiler that's called a two-stage combustor that's working with solid fuels is really um, a, pyrolysis, a, a pyrolysis unit with a blown gas-to-gas -gas combustor overhead. Pyrolysis, you're taking in enough air to generate the gases, um, have them come up, and then mixing them overhead with air. If you put all the air in, in the base, again, it's very difficult to um, not have the pyrolysis run away and go so fast that it consumes all the air in the charcoal down in the base, and you have nothing to deal with the gases up above. Okay? So by limiting that, you, you can control the rate of gas production and then um, combust it reasonably above. So that's what's going on in a tea lead stove, for instance. <coughs> okay? I'm sorry, I missed the, the part where the exhaust gas, which is hot, helps you lower or cool the gas. Well, it, it, it's relatively cool. It's heating it. It's putting a lot of heat in. Yeah. Okay? So usually, all the, pyrol the charcoal up here is going to... The only heat con contribution is from down here. And if you, we've done a lot of work with profiles down in a standard reactor, and you see that pyrolysis is really only happening in a passive situation in like one to two inches above the nozzles. So it goes from essentially drying temperatures up to 1,000 C in this very short, narrow thing. So pyrolysis, gas is coming out of the wood into these very high temperatures where you get the evolution of these problematic tars. So by doing it over a longer period of time and with a heat, feed, uh, a heat feed that is below these problematic temperatures, you are heating it, but you're not heating it too much. Okay, you're controlling the temperature. Okay. How are you controlling By the engine. Yes. By, by, choosing a, by choosing a waste source that's already correct. So we're not controlling it at all. What comes out of the engine, particularly an, an auto engine, is fairly, fairly consistent until ridiculously high loads. No, it, we're basically trying to keep it to not go over a certain temperature. Okay, you're trying to keep it from the char, the the pyrolysis from happening in something that is 600 C or below. Okay, and it can vary in there. It doesn't have to be an exact narrow window. It's real, the problem is if it goes too high. The problem if it goes too low, it just doesn't happen fast enough. Okay, so we do it. This this gives us a much longer for pyrolysis. You don't end up in the situation that's common in a downdraft where a chunk is pyrolysized on the outside, but it's not finished on the inside, and it's now down in the hearth here trying to combust, but it's still in pyrolysis, and sometimes in the middle it's still in drying. So you want these things fully done. Remember, as you're working with chunk fuels, and so you have insulative problems. The fuel is insulative. You can do something on the surface, and that's very nice, but it's not happening in the center. So you can end up with one chunk that is in... Uh, combustion and reduction on the outside, pyrolysis in an interstitial area and drying still on the inside, such that steam is coming out from the inside, combusting when it hits heat on the outside, or excuse me, steam's coming out, um, pyrolysis is happening inside, coming out, mixing with, with oxygen, burning, and then reducing on the char on the outside of, of the chunk. 
So you can have, a, in a chunk of material, you can have an inside to outside um, downdraft oriented gasifier. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what, you start getting, you know, and in, in, in things that are actually burning in the, in the fire, a chunk of wood, you throw a chunk of wood in, it's not doing one thing. It has all four of those processes going on at the same time. Um, and, and depending on the, the stage it's at and, the, and how, how it's broken and whatnot, you will get these various mixings of drying pyrolysis, combustion, reduction. Okay? So what's burning on the outside can actually be hydrogen and CO that was made by an internal combustion event in the wood that's now reducing on the charcoal on the way out. It can be more than just the pyrolysis gases coming out. Okay. Okay, and then this is how it was built back, back in the day. Uh, it's done quite differently now, but we had you know, the, the standard reactor. It's the, the, the pyrocoil unit that is the exhaust in and out from the engine. The drawing bucket, which is the, the drawing stage attaching to the hopper. Uh, reactor going down into a gas cowling. And all of those coming together on a skid like that. Okay. Okay, so let's take a short break, and then we're going to um, come back. Wait, actually, before we do that. Let me, okay, so those are the, those are the thermal relationships um, and how we've reorganized the four steps and recovered the, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, recovered the, the, uh, the waste heat into something that's more proper, uh, approximating a downdraft. Um, the problem is that explanation is also wrong, um, sadly, after all of that and dragging you through the muck of the science of the four stages. Um, the four, there's actually more going on than four stages in it. There's a fifth stage that's called cracking that is actually our, our largest route towards our end gas state production and um, throws everything for a loop in these things. So that's what we're going to do when we come back. Okay. Uh, cracking of a hydrocarbon is, is like pyrolysis. It's apply, applying enough heat that you break the bonds into smaller and smaller fragments of the fuel. Okay. So there's actually two routes that we use to get to the end small hydrogen and carbon, carbon uh, molecules. The first is the combustion reduction route. The second is a cracking route. If you take a, a long chain hydrocarbon and you take it through adequate heat and adequate resonant time, it will fragment down until it's ultimately H2 and CO. This assumes that the hydrocarbon is some mixture of C, H, and O. Okay? Um, why does this happen? Well, the problem is the, the, uh, the, um, the composition of biomass. Um, biomass was very poorly designed for gasifiers. Um, and so if we ever get really, really excited about bio, um, biomass energy, we'll redesign biomass that works much better in gasifiers. Okay? But the problem follows from um, biomass is an approximation 20% fixed carbon and 80% volatiles. And so when we were going through the pyrolysis stage earlier, we saw as you boil off or distill off all of these volatiles, you're left with about 20, 25% of your original mass in, in, um, in charcoal. Now, as, you know, as a, a molar analysis, it comes out to the same general range. Okay? Um, so what the outputs of pyrolysis is this about 20, 25% of your fixed carbon or your charcoal and about 75 or 80 percent of your tarry gases, okay? That's the foundation of the problem. What the biomass, those ratios that biomass gives you are not such that you can now just fully burn off all the tar gas and reduce it, okay? You have the significant excess of tar gas. In fact, you have over twice the amount of tar gas that you could, um, you could burn and then reduce with the available charcoal. Okay. And it's that excess of tar gas that really starts the foundation of the problem in a, in a biomass gasifier. Okay. You have to come up with these very sensitive conditions inside where you're cracking that, that excess um, tar gas and not having it pass through the system um, unmolested and coming out the end as tar. Okay. And thus starts all of the complexity in these units where people are, are really fighting about um, um, the shape of the hearth, uh, the restriction sizes, the nozzles. That's not, we call that that we want them to get the combustion to work well, but what we're really trying to do is to get the combustion lobe to fully fill that area such that any tar gas that's not actually being combusted is forced through very hot um, 
um, hot areas in its passage downward, hot enough that it cracks um, and on that journey, um, separate of being oxidized. Okay? So, this is also one of the reasons why a charcoal gasifier or a coal gasifier is so much e easier to make run reasonably. Coal is an approximation the opposite. Coal is usually, or can be around, on average, say 80% fixed carbon, 20% volatiles. So when you pyrolysize coal and get all the rest of the volatiles out of there, you have a very small amount of tar gas, and that can be burned completely. You've got plenty of, of, of carbon to reduce that. In fact, you have an excess. You're also going to start burning some of the carbon to then reduce it again um, over the, the remaining carbon bed. Okay? So this is why a, like a, a coal gasification plant is, is much easier to get to work than a biomass gasification plant. Um, what, what are you referring to? Um, biomass gasifiers that use diesel as a supplement to the fuel. In some ways, that actually makes it worse. Um, I mean, if your if your if your poverty is of um, is of the charcoal section for the reduction, to the more more the more vapor you add in of any type, it's going to preferentially burn. Um, leaving a, a larger fraction of the other vapor, which is tar gas, that you have to crack. So, but are you referring to on the engine side, actually? Yes. Okay, so no, that's a, that's a different issue. That's because of the, the that's because of the, the, you know, the combustion mode of a diesel engine. So you can dual, dual fuel diesel engines um, with, with a small, uh, use, <laughs> um, using a small amount of diesel and then adding the rest of your fuel in through the intake of syngas. Okay, um, and so that's that's actually how the power tainer out there is set up. So that's 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 called a dual fuel unit, but it doesn't relate to how the gasifier is actually making making the gas. Okay, just go through the process. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, this fixed carbon to volatile ratio is very relevant and and determining how well the uh, the reactor is going to perform. Um, biomass is fairly stable in the, in the um, 25, 20 to 25% range fixed carbon, 75 to 80% um, um, volatile. You do get outliers in it, um, though, and one of the most useful outliers is the nutshells. Nutshells tend to be higher fixed carbon to volatile, which is one of the reasons why they, they, um, they usually um, have better tar conversion. Okay? Um, <coughs> Other things like uh, animal manures, human solid waste tends to be low in, in, in volatile content because the digestion preferentially takes that out versus the, versus the, car, the, the simple carbon forms or carbon to carbon bonds. Um, not always the case, but you tend to see the animal manures being low volatiles. The problem is animal manures have, have other challenges, that they typically are very high mineral content um, and that mineral content is, is uh, sensitive under the high temperature conditions. The more minerals you, you have in temperature, the more likely you're going to get into slagging and rocks forming in the reactor. Okay? So um, the fixed carbon to volatile ratio is a critical parameter here. The mineral content in other parts of the system or at stages of the system is critical. Um, and then the shape, size, and moisture content will be critical. Okay? Um, okay, so um, it's, it's, it's a foundational problem in a biomass gas fire to get this cracking process working. Um, and there's not a simple one, we've solved it. So when you say in a gas fire, someone says, I've solved the tar problem. You can't actually solve the tar problem. You can manage it, okay? It's a chronic health problem. And it, it's chronic and inevitable because of the character of the biomass. So the goal in a, in a gas fire or designing a gasifier is to get it such that it has the widest range of, re of good con um, management of that tar um, problem as you can. And not have it be you know, um, uh, a wafer thin uh, line of where the thing is, is going to actually work. Okay? So when we're, you know, in our systems right now, we have a, a certain window over which we get reasonable performance. If you can stay in that, everything's great. The goal over time is to keep making that window wider and wider and wider, such that it can manage progressively more difficult situations. 
So when we're trying to assess whether we can do a project or not, or if someone's having success on the other end, it's not that the gas fire works or doesn't work. It's that can we keep it in this management window where things are good, okay? And that's, that's the motivation for a lot of the automation, for the work we've done in, in characterizing reactors and um, formalizing tar conversion um, and relating it to temperature and run conditions that we can now measure in real time, okay? So the, the um, operation method that we give for either the kits or the, or the power pallets has produced kind of a speedometer and a tachometer for gasifiers. And if you keep things within the range we say, we know that we've created the conditions where this tar cracking is happening. Okay? Any questions on that? Where, physically on the, the GEC unit, where is this cracking taking place? Well, that's the problem. In any gasifier, not just this gasifier, it's happening in the, uh, in the bed. The cracking is, is happening simultaneous with combustion right in here. Okay, so the air is coming in, it's mixing with the tar gas that's coming down from the top. Part of it's combusting, the rest we want to be cracking in this area with um, um, adequate heat and residence time. The problem is where that's happening is all the void spaces between the fuel. Okay, um, so in some sense our cracking vessel isn't the shape of the gasifier here. Our cracking vessel is, is the remaining spaces between the fuel. That's where the real flow is, okay? So this is one of the reasons why these type of gasifiers are so sensitive to, to fuel shape and size. Because really, your fuel is your reactor. All the space between the fuel is the reactor. You're suggesting some things and orientations by where you're having, having the nozzles and sizing and whatnot, but you change the fuel and you really, you totally change all of those interstitial spaces where the gas is flowing, okay? So where you're doing your cracking is in all of these void spaces. <coughs> Air comes in, we burn the tar gas, creates heat. Um, you know, we want to see temperatures above 900 C or so for tar cracking to work. And we're counting on there being that temperature lasting long enough, having a long enough resonance time that the pyrolysis gas coming down through here that isn't oxidized itself is cracked, is broken apart and making the same H2 and CO coming out the end, okay? The problem is, where's that, where that's happening in these void spaces in, in the, the char bed is fighting you the whole time, okay? The char is reactive. As soon as you combust anything here, you now have CO2 and water vapor and, it, and a ton of heat, so what happens? The reduction reactions start. The reduction reactions are endothermic and take, in, take um, energy out of the system, that's the temperature drops. So to the degree which you combust anything here and it starts reacting with these charcoal walls, um, the temperature is immediately going to drop, which what you really want to be happening is those temperatures stay up such that you finish the cracking process of all the tar coming through. Okay? So um, one of the many reasons why a, uh, uh, a standard downdraft gas fire is a is a, uh, a temperamental beast, okay? Because you now have to not only have to get, get this combustion lobe filling this, you also have to get your void space adequate and your flow rate through here adequate that you essentially uh, slow the reduction reactions adequately that the cracking can finish before the reduction reactions take over, okay? So you have these two processes that are fighting each other and they're usually solved through getting to very very specific flow rates or a range of flow rates that keep these things in, in an adequate proportion that you finish the cracking despite the char fighting you in the process. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So, so, how do you adjust those flow rates? Are we get into that? Well, it's power amounts. How, you know, how, how much power you're pulling out of the thing. So gas fires tend to have a, a, a fairly narrow range over which they'll all of these relationships, these competing relationships work out well and you get a clean gas. So part of the challenge in the design is widening, widening that as much as possible. And you know, we can go about one to 10, um, from like one kW to 10 kW. Um, so that's a very wide turn down ratio. And a lot of that happens again because of the, the, the external driving of the pyrolysis, which gives us a much easier tar to crack down in here, okay? So, when you have these more difficult tars that we were explaining last night that are more refractory, now your conditions down here have to be um, um, 
better, um, more elaborated, um, they have to, to, to successfully break all that, okay? As the guitars get easier to crack, you need, you need um, less exotic conditions down here, okay? So, what's usually not understood when people are looking at where is the CO and H2 coming, that actually more H2 and CO is coming out of the base here through this cracking route that is coming from the combustion and reduction route. And that's never drawn out in the, in the charts. But when you go and actually do the math um, of what is the mass flow through this thing, what are your different components, you go, wow, this is, a, this is a partial combustion cracker that we're running. And this is a terribly designed partial combustion cracker. Okay? So you'll see us in, in next steps here um, removing this cracking dependency from the bed. Uh, there's designs that are coming down the road in the six months or, or year range that create dedicated chambers and void spaces where the combustion and cracking happen separate of the bed. And then after that, um, the gas is returned back to the, to the solid bed to run reduction. Okay? Once you have a dedicated area, now you're designing the shape and size of that. Uh, it's volume, it's residence time, and it's independent of what the fuel is. Okay? So you reduce the dependency on the void space of the fuel because you're no longer relying on that void space for, um, the, the, to, to form your cracking vessel. Okay? So that'll be a critical next step you'll see in here. Um, in the interim, you know, we've got it. We don't need to run the, you know. So historically, what they did to solve this problem is they used huge chunk fuel. Um, and the point of that was um, not just for easy gas flow through it, but also to reduce the, the reaction area. To the degree which you get a, your, uh, bigger chunks, you have less surface area to mass in your fuel. So the chunky fuel um, also slows down your reduction rate um, because you have less surface area to, to, um, to react with. Okay? Okay, so, but we've, we've been able to, because of all of this control of pyrolysis and, and um, regenerative <laughs> heat exchange, been able to get it down to work, work on on much smaller fuels, uh, we can work on wood chips. Um, you know, we can't go down to, to any, any sort of dusts or shredded fuels. Those, those don't have adequate void space to, um, to allow this cracking to happen. So the thing that falls apart is not that the gas won't flow through it, is that the cracking um, performance falls apart and you get dirty gas that comes out. So this, the, the cracking issue here is, is the, the, the need to get these cracking relationships right is, is, is the tar challenge. And why when you go to more simple gasifiers like a stratified downdraft, um, still the zones are in this order, but you don't set up the situation where you, 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 you successfully get these tar, this cracking happening. Okay? Um, like if you look at the, the common Indian gasifiers that are open top, stratified downdraft, you run rice husks in them, um, air is coming down through the lid, you don't create this, this kind of controlled area of very high temperatures that you've fully covered in a combustion lobe um, such that you're, you know you're taking the tar gases through above 900 C um, areas. And you're further working within very small void spaces of the small fuel, which is driving your temperature down through the reduction reactions. So those beds at the highest point of, of combustion, they, they tend to get up into the 800 C range, but very quickly fall, fall below that, okay, from reduction of the very high surface area, okay? That's helpful with rice husks, because now you don't get slagging. Rice, rice husks have over 20% silica in them, but it's unhelpful in that you don't convert the tar, and that all comes out, and then it gets dealt with after the fact um, to great problems in sl um, tar slurry ponds. So the point of these, all these units are it is required to deal with the, the tar problem at the point of generation. It has to, we have to solve it in the reactor. We're not going to put a Band-Aid on the end um, because those Band-Aids really just transfer the problem to somewhere else where you now have a disposal problem and usually do it at great complexity, cost, logistical hassle, um, and stench. So uh, one of the a main feature of this building that most people don't recognize is that it doesn't smell like gasifiers. Um, if you go to any, um, any water filtering based uh, gasifier installation, the stench that's coming out of that is unbelievable. Okay? So we've really tried to get these things um, to, the, to a, uh, an olfactory, olfactory um, uh, 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 tolerable 
um, situation. You still, they will get some barbecue, but if you get a good, if you get a good solid um, um, bucket of tar, we can probably find one around here. It's a, it's a unique beast. Okay. What does it smell like? Think of the, the worst, nastiest smoking motel room you've ever <laughs> stayed in, um, and then get it wet. <laughs> and then um, there's some other things that have to be added there. No, it's different cat piss. We can, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll find you a sample. Okay, so that's the cracking issue. The cracking issue is very important. Whoops, don't go there. Okay, so um, when you're putting this together, uh, when you're putting this together in a gasifier, the fun, the fun becomes that all the stuff that we're looking at on how we want these, this thing to work chemically is very different than what we're trying to do um, in our thermal relationships. And it's very different than what we're trying to do with, our, with kind of the mechanical flow of the fuel. There unfortunately isn't one reactor that optimizes all the chemical relationships, optimizes all the thermal relationships, and makes the, f the fuel flow perfectly. You're working trying to solve multiple problems simultaneously in the smallest space possible, and the solution, the optimized solution for one set of variables is in opposition or fighting the other one. So this is either the fun or the curse of gasifier design in that it, it is a 3D thermal, chemical, mechanical, gravimetric puzzle, okay? So to help think about that puzzle, I, I've come up with a, a couple of um, um, you know, uh, uh, models or idealizations of the different questions you're trying to solve, okay? So first one, the ideal thermal relationships. If we were to make a perfect gasifier, all the energy that was created in combustion would be used at each of the successively lower stages. This is close to what we have in an in a updraft gasifier, but we you know, have walls and whatnot such that we're also getting, getting lost out of the walls. So if you could build it and use it, thermally the perfect gasifier would be a series of concentric spheres that you're Combustion would be in the middle. All of that energy would be mined into reduction on the next, next shell layer. Um, energy after that would go into pyrolysis and then finally drying, and everything that came out the end would have been used. Okay? Now, unfortunately, that set of relationships for, for, your, for your, your um, thermal needs is in complete conflict with what you want to see in your, your chemical relationships. Okay? <laughs> Um, so what we have here is a, uh, is, a, um, is a rendering of chemical flow <laughs> through the gas fire based on a downdraft and also based on a, a four-step process. We really need to add a, a cracking step in here. Okay? The basic process order, drying, pyrolysis, combustion, reduction. Um, is different than we see in the ideal thermal gasifier. In the perfect thermal gasifier, these two are reduced or these two are, are reversed. In fact, the heat is going from combustion, reduction, pyrolysis, drying. So all of this stuff here is completely out of order, which is why we have all of the heat um, uh, rerouting and regeneration, okay? Um, but beyond just the, the raw processes being out of order, you start to see that what you wanna do with the solids and the gas during the steps is very different. There's times where you want a solid to go to the next step but not the gas, and you want the gas to go around. So we've divided this chart um, between sol the solid flow on the bottom and the gas flow on the top, um, and we want to look at that through the four um, basic steps of a, a, a downdraft orientation. Okay? So let's talk through that. If we bring biomass into this model, into the drying step, uh, we add heat through something, um, and the output is dry biomass and water vapor, okay? The dry biomass, we want to go to the next step of pyrolysis, but the water vapor is not helping us in pyrolysis and is probably hurting the situation. We would rather the, wa the, the water vapor to pass pyrolysis, okay? In fact, the water vapor isn't relevant again in this system until reduction, okay? But we see in a standard downdraft reactor, any of the, the water vapor that we create at the drying stage passes through all those, 
those pyrolysis and combustion stages before it any does, does any useful work again in drying. Okay. Okay, so at the end of drying, water vapor's gone out, biomass is going forward uh, into pyrolysis. So in pyrolysis, the dry biomass becomes char. Um, actually, it becomes two things, char and tar gas. The tar gas we want to use in the next stage of combustion, but the char, we don't want to burn the char in combustion. We already have a poverty of char, okay? So the passing of the tar gas and the char together into combustion <laughs> creates this mixed um, solid gas situation where, fortunately, preferentially, we burn the tar, but we also consume some amount of the, the charcoal, um, even further re reducing our, our, our poverty of that, and then increasing the amount of cracking we have to do. Okay? So the ideal gasifier, from a chemical perspective, would be that the char passes combustion, and it goes around, r around that and only becomes relevant again in reduction. Okay? So, and at the reduction stage, we've, we would ideally want to regather the water vapor that started way here on, uh, at the first stage, the char from the second stage, put, and then put all those together with the heat from combustion and get our, our, um, our output gases, H2 and CO, okay? So, as you can see, this set of chemical relationships looks very different than our ideal thermal relationships, which leads to all the redirects of the toddy, okay? Furthermore, um, adding to a whole set of disasters in this is the reality of solid fuels. Solid fuels are very different than working with li liquids and gases. And as soon as you start working with them, you realize very quickly that it wasn't a mass conspiracy of standard oil um, that um, did our transition to, to liquid fuels. Uh, solid fuels are difficult. Uh, they don't flow, they don't find level, they, they sit at angles of repose, um, they're difficult to pump. Um, and we, when we pump them, we call, use augers or conveyors or whatnot. Things bind um, during those processes. Um, they don't like to flow, uh, flow through shapes. Um, there's all sorts of bridging activity that happens. Whenever you want to redirect them into a smaller area, there's certain ratios of fuel size to that opening, to the geometry of the opening, that if you get wrong, everything stops. The fuel itself can compress, unlike a, you know, it can, excuse me, it can stand up in, in, in compression, like logs or blocks, such unlike a, a liquid or a gas, you're not gonna get a little, a little spout of liquid standing up, but you can get a little spout of solid fuel standing up. So you can have a straight vessel that you have a little bolt sticking out the side that no one was noticing. That can stop the fuel coming down, and then everything can just start stacking on top of that. Okay? So, one, you know, gas fire design usually starts as a lab project thinking about these thermal chemical relationships, and then at the end of it, everyone's pulling out their hair doing ag engineering trying to figure out how to make solid materials move. Um, and those problems become um, shockingly complex, both on the feed inside of the system, as well as keeping it flowing down into the hearth area, as well as probably most delicately, how do you get the fuel to size reduce to very small charcoal and ash, and then get that out of the system without it forming a big cake and pack, pack down there in the base, okay? Um, I haven't put together a, a whole slide or a set of slides on all, all of the solid fuel handling concepts, but um, the ideal, if I was to say the ideal gas fire mechanically would be a, a piece of fuel falling through open air with no gasifier. Anything you do in the gas fire is a problem. Okay. Okay. So, um, that's what leads us to uh, gas fire design being a 3D thermal chemical mechanical gravimetric puzzle with no discrete puzzle pieces um, to use to solve it. Okay? We just went through the thermal chemical mechanical gravimetric part. The last part of it that we're going to do now is why is there actually really no, dis <coughs> no discrete puzzle pieces? Okay? And we, we refer to this in house both affectionately and screaming is gasification is all variables all the time. Okay? And why do I say that? So far, we've been talking about each of these four or five processes as something that's kind of discrete, drying, pyrolysis, combustion, <coughs> reduction, and cracking. The problem is, within each of those processes, there's huge variables going on and a continuum over which 
um, our inputs produce various types of outputs. Though each of those four processes um, can be uh, altered or controlled in manners that are either helping or hurting you in, in the next related steps in the gasifier. Okay? So as your gasifier designs get more refined, you start taking control of each of these stages and optimizing them such that what you do with the outputs later in the gasifier are, um, are, are, are better aligned with the needs of those next steps. Okay? A, your starting gasifier is you know, a standard Embert downdraft is just a, a vertical um, you know, a vertical column, and these things are all mixed together. You're not controlling where one starts or stops. You're not controlling the temperature. Um, other, you're not controlling other other um, inputs to the process. And as gasifiers get get more accurate in their conversions, you move towards multi-stage architectures where you deal with each of these stages independently um, and with separate control of each stage. The problem is that that tends to be done in a big multi-stage vessel thing where you have a dedicated vessel for each of these things and then you're moving gases and liquids between them um, and you end up with a very complicated plant uh, type arrangement. So the challenge in this has been to, or in these, has been to go to a, a full multi-stage architecture but to do it in something that it, it closely approximates a single vessel system as possible. Um, and by doing that, getting to where we can have this compact form factor, a very dense power generation um, device. Okay. Okay. So let's go through the variability in, in each in each of these four stages. Um, drying isn't just drying. Um, drying is very dependent on temperature, gas flow, particulate size, species, natural or densified. To the degree to which you have a chunk of fuel in there, the fuel itself is insulative. Everything you want to do on the inside. Okay, so your time to dry varies greatly by, by um, the size of the fuel. Um, if the fuel is densified versus, versus uh, solid fuel, densified fuels don't have the natural fragments and pathways um, for gas flow that, that a, um, a natural fuel has. So the, the drying carry of them will be very different, as well as the pyrolysis char char uh, character downstream. Um, drying is, is impacted from gas flow as it is from heat. You can have heat but no, nothing moving through the fuel, you get almost nothing, okay? You can have lots of flow through the fuel and no heat and you'll actually do better than, or have low heat and lots of flow will give you better drying than a lot of heat and no flow, okay? So your drying area, you'd ideally like to have it designed in some manner that you're getting, you're getting flow through the system, okay?